Welcome everybody to Freaky Tales Podcast, episode four. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, sometimes I look so forward to this that I cannot wait till Friday. I know a lot of you DM me or inbox me and tell me, you know, I can't wait till for Friday. And uh, believe me, I feel the same way. You know, it's like something new to me. But you know what? Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. Above me should be the Gmail, the Freaky Tales Podcast Gmail. Uh, where you can um, submit your stories. If you have anything that's happened to you, which is paranormal, anything freaky, anything uh, ghost story, anything that maybe your family passed on to you that told you that happened to them, you can share it with us. At the end of the show, we will share three more stories. We'll try to get to four, depending on the time, but we'll definitely try to get to some more stories. So once again, Freaky Tales Podcast at gmail.com. You guys could submit your stories. We would love to hear from you. Uh, we've already shared about six stories on the show, and we will continue to share more. Um, below me, you should see the Freaky Tales podcast on Instagram. So you can follow us on Instagram as well for future content. So once again, I want to thank everybody who has subscribed, everybody who shared, everybody who commented, whether it's negative or positive, it doesn't really matter. You know what? It all helps the show. So uh, without further ado, please allow me to introduce to you my very special guest, Rick Creeper. How are you doing, brother? Thank you for having uh, me. Brother, I'm good. Uh, I was excited for you to be here today. Well, it's an honor and privilege to be here. Thank you. Uh, you know what? For people that are probably wondering who exactly is Rick Creeper, first of all, your IG is popping up so they can follow you on IG and hit you up on the DM and ask you whatever. But um, can you share possibly just a little bit of your background so the people that know what you do or what you're involved in okay well i've been a, a scare actor in the haunt industry since 2018. i worked for an uh, in, uh, independent company called center po sinister point productions last year i worked at queen mary's dark harbor okay i also built um haunts on the side as an independent contractor here and there i just been a dude that's been into horror and hall you know, halloween and just ghost stories since i was a kid i've always been active of researching and going on paranormal tours and whatnot just uh you know it's what's behind the veil it's always been interesting to me so what, what, what do you think it is that intrigues you to look behind the veil to me i've always i've always i always thought there's more to life than what's out there yeah. you know there, there's always the what of the un, the unexplained and uh just uh if it goes from just like urban legends actual ghost stories or us you know having I, some i know people i've talked to they've had uh, experiences where like um past loved ones have reached out to them. I know it's happened to me, but uh, it's. I think it's just the unknown of life. You know, there's definitely more to life than just a nine to five and paying bills. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and there's always a lot of questions that people, um, it's almost like they have questions that have gone on for years unanswered. Yeah. And I'm not saying that through this podcast, you know, we're gonna attempt to answer them, but possibly shed a little bit of light, you know? Uh, because none of us here are professionals in the paranormal. Oh, no. You know, but we only share what we do know, what, what has happened to us or mm -hmm. to our loved ones. You can only speak of our personal experiences or stories we've been told by friends and family. So. Yes. Um, you know, earlier this week, we were talking about what we were going to talk about. I like to be on the same page. I just don't like to invite anybody and just kind of freestyle it. Mm -hmm. I want to have something kind of like a plan. Yeah. You know, something good that we can serve to the people that are watching. And I want to start with this. And what I'm about to share is public knowledge. And you can 
look it up yourself on Google and it'll most likely lead you to the actual footage of what happened to this woman in uh, 2013, I wanna say seven years ago. Mm -hmm. This woman was from uh, Canada and she was a student. She came uh, at a to a stay at a hotel uh, 2013 he called Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles and uh, a lot of people know it they changed the name of it now because of that but it's right by Skid Row mm -hmm. she came to stay for a couple of weeks and then move on I believe she was going to go uh, up north she was out here just for a trip if I'm correct mm -hmm. but you guys can look it up and her name was um, Elisa Lam uh, L-A-M Elisa Lam and the footage goes like this, and I'm, I know you're familiar with it, but I want to use this as a springboard, if you will, to jump into what we're going to be talking right. about. It sh the footage actually shows her walking into an elevator, pressing the buttons, the, the elevator door not closing, and it continues to show her looking out both ways, stepping back in, hiding, coming back out. And there's even a point where people have speculated that she comes out of the elevator door and the elevator door still does not close. And supposedly she's having a conversation with someone who's not there. Mm -hmm. She comes back in, presses all the elevator doors uh, um, or the elevator levels or floors, if yeah. you will, still doesn't close. She walks out and this goes on for several minutes. The elevator door closes. Now, here's the interesting part. She disappears. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what happens to her. I was surprised that they didn't have footage of the hallway of the elevator so that we can see where she went. We just had the footage from the elevator looking down at her. Well, I believe it was about a week later. It could have been two, but I'm gonna stick, I believe to a week later, people started complaining that the water in the hotel started to smell. Mm -hmm. Some people were brushing their teeth with the water. Some people were bathing in the water and water started coming out brown mm -hmm. i remember this they finally after searching the police search dogs they couldn't find anything um they went up to the roof to check the water there's on the roof there's a huge tank mm -hmm. and within that tank they found her drowned dead naked um, the reports were that there was no way that this woman could have because they never found her clothes mm. This woman could have addressed herself, climbed up, lift up the lid, threw herself in there, and then covered the lid Cut back the up. Lid herself. Unsolved mystery. Mm -hmm. People speculate, and this is where I'm going, that she was being chased by a ghost, talking to a ghost. She was seeing things. We don't know. We don't know. From what you can remember, what were some of the things possibly that you heard of where they, uh, did you hear the same ghost story type of deal? I heard, I heard two two different versions that it was actually um, there was some type of specter some type of ghost mm -hmm. that, that uh, was following her and she was trying to get away from something and also heard that it was some type of it was premeditated it was murder right. but I, I believe the building is actually it's been known to uh, have high, uh, high cases of a paranormal activity and if I'm not mistaken there's been actual investigations as well as far as EVP and, and other people going in recording video and getting EVP so there's the two theories um Yes, she was definitely in distress. She seemed she seemed very paranoid. And the fact that she kept looking out in the hallway that something was pursuing her. Yeah. Who knows what it was? If it was it was someone who was just you know, malicious that had an ill intent or it was an evil spirit that was after her. Yeah, we, we don't we don't know. But if you guys look at the footage, Elisa Lam, Cecil Hotel, look it up. It was uh seven years ago and it's still considered an unsolved um mystery murder. You know we don't know um now after doing a little bit of research i found out that years prior that richard ramirez the night stalker actually yeah. stayed there you really know, actually wow. lived there for well for a couple of weeks okay. that he was there um and other people but i don't want to give too much away i like to let people go dig for themselves mm -hmm. so now after sharing that my question to you is since we're going to be talking about uh the paranormal the ghost if you will Rick, do you believe in ghosts? I believe in ghosts. I believe that people um, that pass from a, tra a, tra a tragic tragedy or a tragic death, um, their spirits linger. That's just my beliefs. 
um, half the time, I think they don't realize they're dead or there, there's an attachment to properties or, or um, possessions they don't want to leave. But I think there's something out there, definitely uh, besides us. And uh, especially in something that has an old history, like these old buildings down downtown LA, the Roosevelt Hotel and so forth. But I definitely feel even even loved ones too that don't have don't have ill intent but um the experiences i've had and the stories i've been told it just uh i'm not surprised that there's there's something beyond the veil there, there's more to life than just the grave i think there's definitely something in the afterlife yeah you know there's some people that believe in hell some people believe in heaven some people believe in purgatory, purgatory. and then some people believe that you can still be around mm -hmm. You know, it makes me think of the movie Ghost that came out, if I'm correct, in the 80s mm -hmm. with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore when the guy died, but he didn't even realize that he, he was, was dead, dead. Yeah. like you said. And then there's others that see a light and then there's others that dark shadows come for them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because I have seen some of those dark shadows amongst <laughs> people and I've shared that here before. and. I don't know if you want to get into it as far as one of your stories that you wanted to share about pertaining to either ghost or shadows or whatever the case. So it's funny that you, um, your previous episode, you mentioned uh, you had a guest on your other platform that you you noticed that um, a figure or a dark shadow was hovering around him. So it's kind of the same thing happened to me when I was 19 years old. And we're all, you know, we're, when we're younger, you don't make the best decisions. And at the time, I was running around with a, with a group of guys who probably weren't the probably the best decisions to hang out with and the smartest guys to hang out with a lot of them are probably no longer here or they're probably incarcerated i was a young man made dumb decisions so we're at a we're at a get together at a house in a certain neighborhood we shouldn't have been in and i'm approached by someone from that neighborhood and um he probably wasn't the right frame of, uh, frame of mind probably drugs or whatever and so uh he he confuses me with someone else mm. and so there's an altercation whatever there's interaction and um I was put in a circumstance there that was life-threatening. But when I'm looking at him, uh, there was some type of black aura or energy that hovered above him. And it didn't blend in with the night sky or the night environment. There was something above him. And it towered like 10 feet above him. And I'm looking at this guy. And I'm looking at what's behind him. And I'm like, and I just got the worst feeling, sick to my stomach. I mean, I was sick to my stomach because of the life-threatening situation. But also, I'm looking at this entity or this figure, whatever it was, that was literally attached to him. So he came to the census because someone approached him and said, hey, you know, you got the wrong guy, this, that, and the other. I left. And what I was told the next morning, that he had two other inc incidents with someone else, that eventually uh, his life was ended that night. So um, whatever was attached to him, whatever I saw that was projecting from him, or whatever entity, demon, whatever spirit was uh, hovering above him, maybe it, it took over his, his better judgment. Maybe uh, he was possessed. I don't know. And that was his death wish, who knows? But the energy that I got from him and it just, it wasn't, wasn't the greatest feeling in the world. And it got to a point, like, I was like, either my life is threatened, I need to leave. And when I heard what happened to him, I couldn't believe what happened. So um, who knows, was some shadow figure that was just predetermined his life or was puppeteering to make bad, bad decisions. But I obviously saw it. And throughout the night, he made bad decisions to the point finally his life was ended. Wow. So when I heard your story, it just, it kind of, it triggered a memory for me when I was 19. I'm 44 now. This happened when I was 19 and obviously I've changed my way since, but, um, I'll never forget that night cause I'm focused on him and, uh, this the circumstance we're in, I won't go into details, but I saw this huge figure that was surrounded and it, it, it not necessarily like a shadow, but it had a hu human like fit features, no facial features, just in, like a silhouette. Wow. And it towered over him. He was a, probably about a good five, five nine, probably five ten. I'm six four, but this thing was a good three, four feet taller than him. Wow! And it was darker than the night sky. And we're in the we're in the backyard, and this figure stuck out, and just uh, that's just been unsettling. Wow. I, I guess I could picture it right now. So wow. it, so when I heard the story you talked about, it was it was relatable. So you know, here's a story that happened to me in 1994. Um, I, I go to jail, go to county jail. Okay. And I'm in there. Everybody that's been to county jail knows that it, the worst thing for you to go to county is the processing. Mm. The processing is horrible. And they move, they, they tell me to pretty much go in this room or go in that room. Yeah. Because we're about to, after we're there for about another five hours, they're going to move us into another room. So I didn't want to go in the first room because everybody's going into the first room. And this is no lie. 
I saw this one guy, a bald headed guy, probably about my height, okay? okay? And I'm following him. And it, it, it was so weird because I saw his head. You know when somebody sweats, steam, especially if you're bald headed, steam uh, at the gym, especially yeah. if you guys that steam comes off their head. But this one was a little darker than just steam. Huh. I, I just thought it was weird. So he goes into the second room. Nobody's in the second room. And I follow him. And when he sits down, he looks at me. And I saw his face completely tattooed, okay? Completely tattooed. Now, as far as I can remember, at least in the neighborhood that I grew up in, most guys that got tattoos around the face area was either one right here, one right here, or a teardrop. In the early 90s, that's the way it was. It wasn't popular back then. It, it wasn't. Yeah. I sat down and I saw his face completely covered in tattoos, and I still saw this little, like, mm -hmm dark grayish type of whatever steam it was mm -hmm. and I, I look at him and I walk out of that room mm -hmm. into back to the first room and I'm crowded in there right well one of the deputies tells me get back over there and I was like well I just want to sit in here get back over there so I go back and I sit in there and it wasn't because he had his face tattooed up because of whatever I saw it just didn't feel right it just didn't feel right I go in there and two other guys go in there but the guy here's the funny part when I turned around and I looked at him, whatever I might have saw when I first saw him disappear because he had no tattoos on his face. And I looked at him and I still saw the little aura around him, if you will, mm -hmm. like something like this. Yeah. And uh, I just kept looking at him. He just said, what are you looking at? And I just said, no, nah. I said, and I told him, I said, I just saw something weird on your face. And he said, like, what? And I said, and I just told him the truth. He saw that I was being sincere. I said, well, I followed you in when I sat down next to you. I looked at you and your face was completely covered in tattoos. Mm -hmm. And he said, I ain't got no tattoos. He goes, I got tattoos on my arms. Yeah. And I was like, no, it was just weird because I'd never seen anything just completely. So I walked out. It kind of freaked me out. And then I, I didn't talk about the shadow thing, you know. And he was like, you sure? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, are you sure it was me? And the other guys were freaking out that I'm sharing the story. And I'm so like, they picked up on the vibe that you're giving off to this guy. The other guys in the, the other cell, he's in there too. Yes. Yes. And I said, I just, I, I didn't know what to say, man. He goes, nah, I ain't got no tattoos. But for that instance, I saw that. Mm -hmm. But I also saw that figure. Whatever that was, I don't know. But now, since you said you saw this, I guess, uh, around what size the figure was around this person. Mm -hmm. I seen smaller ones following people. And I seen one following a lady. This one looked like a shadow of a gorilla and this was during the day, okay? Now, the other one was at night and it was darker than the night. And this one, th the weirdest part, it was like, this was like on a man, but a piggy bank. You know how you give somebody a- Yeah. It was like that. Huh. He was just clinging on and the man was just walking. And, and this thing was clinging on to him. That's crazy. Yeah. and. I never really go around sharing those stories because you know how crazy it is to tell people. No one's going to believe. Yeah. You know, imagine I meet somebody and I go, hey, man, I just saw this dark shadow. They're going to think you're on something. They're on a good one. Yeah. And, and believe me, I've shared this with a lot of, uh, I've shared that I've had paranormal experiences with people mm -hmm. and some people, believe it or not, are like, okay. Some people, I, I think it depends on their beliefs or, or you know, how open-minded they are. Um, some people are standoffish and some people will, will agree. It, it's a trip when you have a paranormal experience and you share with someone yeah. and it's the same scenario, the same the same location, circumstance. And they're like, well, what did you see? Cause that happened to me working in Queen Mary. Okay. They're like, what did you see? Well, what did you see? And we're both waiting to, to share each other's stories and they're identical. So um, last year I worked at the Queen Mary uh, for their Dark Harbor, their haunted attraction okay. uh, for, for the Halloween season. And the, the maze I worked on was on the ship. And it's a part of the ship that supposedly uh, there's a female en entity that, that I guess occupies that area. At, at the Queen Mary. In this, in this section of the ship I'm working in. Wow. And I start hearing stories from the guys like they, um, they had like a little altar, like offerings, like peace offerings. They're like, they offered flowers and candy. They put a candle there, they didn't light it. And I saw a little styrofoam uh, crucifix, like the type you would put like in a bou bouquet of flowers or someone's headstone, like mm -hmm. in porcelains or whatever. Didn't dawn on me. I saw that. I'm like, okay. And some of the guys carried rosaries or some holy water or whatever, or just good luck trinkets or whatever. So they're like, yeah, we offer stuff to um, the lady that occupies this area. 
some whatever some i didn't think nothing of it it's an old ship it's over 100 years old i think it got torpedoed in, in transit during world war ii it used to be called the great ghost the ship Whoa. and it got it um it was a cargo and a passenger ship and it, it took uh troops from the u.s to europe and it, i think medical supplies and so forth and i think it got uh, torpedoed or it got attacked by some u-boats german u-boats and um there's been EVP investigation stores, people drowning in the pools. There's been murders. There's been tragedy on the ship. Wow. So I'm on the ship and um, I, I can think of five things that happened to me and I'll narrow it down to a couple. So I'm wearing a backpack and I have all my stuff in there, personal belongings, whatever. And where I need to go down to the area that I'm working as a monster in the maze and I'm in costume and makeup, pretty steep stairwell. And you, you, get, a, you get a sense that you're not by yourself. Hmm. But also at the same time, you're like, okay, we're in a maze. It looks scary. But there's a difference from like something like this, which is fake. And it's just images to like, you know, you have heightened senses and you feel like you're not by yourself or you're being watched. And I felt like I was being watched the entire time. So I'm about to go down the stairwell. And most backpacks have like a handle right about here. Right. So you could carry like this or whatever. And it feels like my bag's getting hung up on something. And I like to debunk everything. And it feels like... I'm being withheld and I'm thinking, okay, maybe the one that straps in the bag is it's stuck on the railing of the handle of the, the, the handles that go down the stairwell. So it comes undone. I'm like, okay, I didn't think nothing of it. Happens to me again, another night, this time a little more aggressive. So I feel the actual pressure of my bag being held from that handle. And when I go to look back, it felt like if someone pulled me back and then let me forward. Mm. So I actually, um, I almost fell down the stairs. That, that kind of made the hairs in the back of my neck stand up. So I'm all, okay, didn't think nothing of it. That's, I just wrote it off. But, you know, I was scared. Yeah. So I'll go in the area that I'm working. And I'm, I'm supposed to hide in this area that's all tarped off, the black tarps, and I jump out and scare the guest. And so the tarp, I'm going to maybe an area that's like six by six. Mm -hmm. The tarps are blowing, starts hitting me and my legs. I'm like, okay, there's probably a door being opened. There's a porthole, ocean breeze, whatever. Then I feel the tarp pressing up against my neck and my back, like if someone's pushing on it. Mm. And I, I felt like light pressure in the back of my head and my neck and my back. And I pushed it to fix it. And just to be on the safe side, I open the tarp and I'm in, it's pretty much a doorway that's taped off. And I open up the tarp, turn the lights onto the room. There's nothing in there besides props, mannequins. There's no port windows, there's no doors. Don't think nothing of it. Turn the light off again, happens again. So finally I'm like, hey, uh, this is your home. So I, I say this out loud to myself. This is your home. I'm just visiting. I mean, no disrespect. That was the second or third night. Right. The fourth night. Um, and again, I try to debunk everything. I'm working in the area as the character I'm scaring in the maze. And a lot of the people that work mazes, they're, they're performers, they're singers or actors. Like, you know, I'm very vocal when I'm a monster. So not in the distance, but right in my earshot, right about here. I hear a woman harmonizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just humming to herself. But it was right here. And it made, it made my skin crawl. And I'm thinking, okay, our break room for the actors is right around the corner. I'm going to assume that's uh, that's one of the girls warming up her vocals. Yeah. And it kept going and going and going. And this entire time, I'm thinking, they told me there's a woman, there's a female specter that possesses this area or is in this area. And that happens. And the same night, I'm looking out the doorway in the area that I scare people. Yeah. And at this moment, no guests were coming, no management, no staff, and it got really quiet. Like the air got still, like to a point you could hear yourself breathing. Wow. And it's just very unsettling. And then I'm looking out the door that I'm in to the exit of the maze. We have no fog machines in this area. And it looked like fog, gray fog was just kind of floating in the air just shimmering like this is back and forth and uh it looked like something wanted to manifest or develop and i'm like we don't have fog machines in this maze we don't have an effect that does that wow i share the same exact stories with the guy that works in the same area but i don't share the stories first i'm like hey let me ask you a question and he kind of picked up on my vibe like there's something going on here i'm like well what did you experience he's like what did you experience when we talked to each other we had the same experiences the only thing he didn't he didn't experience was the uh the woman harmonizing, but um, he felt someone touching him. He saw the, the figure, ghost or smoke, whatever was developed. He saw that. He got touched. He got pushed. It got to a point um, when he kept getting touched through the tarp. He slammed the door shut and he's like, I'm not going to work in there the rest of the night. 
So that made me a little more on edge just because the fact that someone else experienced it and I didn't even tell them what happened. Wow. And when I talked to other staff that worked there, um, one person shared with me that they had their hand on the wall and they're waiting for an actor to come around the corner so they can jump out and scare him. He had his hands on the edge of a wall and a skeletal hand came across and it kind of just touched wow. touched hands, like a skeletal hand. And then he heard, heard his name being called. He comes running up the stairs past me and he says, F that, I'm not gonna work down there. I'm like, why? He's all, someone someone just touched me and someone just called my name. I'm like, you sure it's no one pulling a prank on you? He's like, no. Flash forward, that area coincidentally was um, known for a story that a man got killed in there. Hmm. And it became kind of an urban legend on the ship, an actual, an actual uh, employee of the ship. Well, they decided to open up that area to, to uh, utilize it for the maze and they actually made one of the actors that character that died wow and coincidentally people down there were getting sick or just getting hurt falling guests were falling there, there's just some bad energy bad juju in that area we kept hearing on over the radio hey this area code blue whatever they use coincidentally that area would have the highest energy people were getting hurt sick or just hearing noises and being touched wow and that was just one part of the ship that i knew about Right. And right. when I talked to other people that worked in other parts of the ship, they're like, yeah, this place has high energy. There's a lot of stuff going on there. You know, I'm going to share something with you, share two stories with you. One of them happened to me. I want to say I was 18, 19 years old. And uh, since you said this thing or whatever <laughs> the case was, uh, whatever it was, called out his name. Okay. That's just. Um, here's a weird one. Remember back in the days when, uh, and these kids don't know today, we had to use phone books. Yeah. We want to look up somebody. Yellow pages, yeah. Okay. Um, I had a friend that used to string up Coke machines. We used to go on our cruisers, mm -hmm. and we used to have paper route bags. So what we he would string up the, the Coke machine, press it, take all the money out, and all the Cokes would come out. Mm -hmm. So I would be in my cruiser and put all the Cokes there. Right. We went all around town cleaning house, okay? <laughs> and um, one day... You know, I I was trying to be a devil, you know, in Spanish, un malora. Yeah. So, grab one of those coins, and I just put it in the, the, the phone booth. And I just looked up any number, and I'm not lying to you. While, yes. While he's looking, while he's stringing up the co other Coke machine. So, usually, I would just call somebody, hello, who's this? You know, hey. You know, that type of mess. Mm. And, um... This person answered. Now, keep in mind, mm -hmm. I just kind of just went like this. Dip, 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 dip. And here's what I went. I go, hello. And that person wouldn't answer. Mm -hmm. Hello. I kept saying that, trying to scare the person. But I could hear the person breathe. Mm -hmm. This person was going. <clears throat> and it kind of sounded like a somebody fixing themselves in the bed or something or stretching out. Mm -hmm. So I go, hello. And I swear to you, this person said this. I know who you are, Tony. That, that's creepy. I hung up the phone and left my bike there and I told my friend, I grabbed him by the shoulder. You got to know what just happened to me. And I told him, he, of course, he didn't believe me. Of course. But it was just me and him. And I never forgot that story because you're thinking to yourself, how would that person, person might know? know my name? How old were you? About nine, 18, 19 years old. Up to no good. and Up to no good. And I just opened up the phone book, that number. That's just crazy. Yeah. So here's the second one. Since we started this uh, Freaky Tales podcast now, this is our fourth show a month ago. Um, I've been having friends of mine call me and man, I watch your show. I don't really watch your other podcast, mm -hmm. but I've been watching your show and I want to share something with you. I work out of this warehouse in Compton. I work sanitation. And um, there was a guy that was working with me. He lasted about six months, had a heart attack and died here at the job. He goes, and ever since he died, I swear to you, there's somebody behind me all the time. That's crazy. He said, there's aisles. He said, there's aisles. And in these aisles, there's produce. Mm -hmm. I could be in this aisle, and here's another aisle, and another aisle, he says. And you can look back and look through the aisles all the way to the wall. He says, and I swear to you, every time I turn, it's if, like if somebody's looking at me like this. 
but all I see is a dark shadow and it's, mm -hmm. there goes these shadow people. Yeah. I don't know if these are ghosts, shadow people, bad energy. I, I, I'm not going to try to put a name to it, you mm -hmm. know, but um, he says, and every time he goes, and then sometimes from, uh, I think they call it the pro provisional vision. Um, when you could look at your hand, mm -hmm. you could be looking straight, but see something here. Mm -hmm. He says, I could be looking over here straight, picking stuff up and I'll see somebody run by. You'll pick it up in your peripheral. Yeah. Yes. He says, and I, and I look, he says, and I've never experienced that before. Mm -hmm. Now he works these vampire hours, you know, he works, <laughs> he works, you know, late at night. He says, uh, I take my lunch around three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. He says, so I had to clean the restrooms this time. Keep in mind, he goes in the corporate part of this building. There's nobody there. I, I'm the only soul walking around these buildings, turn on the lights, uh, dumping out the trash. So like within four hours, three and a half hours, when these employees come in, their office is clean. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the bathroom, he tells me. So I'm scrubbing, you know, toilets, I'm scrubbing the sink. And all of a sudden I hear boom, boom. So he said, the heck is that? Mm -hmm. So he opens the door and he said, he looks. And there's nobody there. So he's thinking, huh, maybe when I turn on the water, one of the pipes. Yeah, something. That's what he was thinking. Yeah. He said, so I went into the girl's room. There was nobody there. I went into their office. There's nobody there. The office across, nobody there. I came back to the bathroom. Okay, cool. I, I, I'm doing this. He says, and I, I shit you not, Tony. Those were his words. He goes, something grabbed me from the back of my tricep like this. It was a hammer and I turned around and there was nothing there. I ran out <laughs> and I went and told my supervisor, I'm not going back out there. I'm not going back, you know, up there. I don't blame him. And he said, why? And he told him. So the the manager, well, supervisor went up there, grabbed this stuff. He goes, I didn't see anything. He goes, but it did feel a little weird. Mm -hmm. He said, but I didn't see anything. He said, I'm not doing that no more. Now, here's, here's something. He hears a noise. And then now he actually feels something. So it goes along with you, what you were saying, what happened to this gentleman that all of a sudden somebody called his name mm -hmm. and something touched them. So I have heard of stories where people hear things and then where they actually, they are phys physically touched. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend that called me about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks ago when I started this podcast. And uh, so it was two weeks after we started this. And here's what he said. I'm going to share something with you. But if you're going to share it on your podcast, he's like, because I'm not going to email. It's too long. He says, I want you just to leave my name out of it. And I said, okay. Fair enough. You know, no problem. I'm going to share that one a little bit later because that one is, that one's on a whole different other level. <laughs> okay. But um, it goes along with what you were saying about, see, because look, I've seen things, but when it comes to things actually start touching you now, that just becomes something totally different. The only time I experienced it was on that ship. I've seen things. I've had things um, talk to me when I was younger. I, I That's another story I'll share. It was something that I had this figure always reappear to me when I was a kid. And my, when you're subconscious, you're about to fall asleep. You're not awake, but you're not asleep. You start drifting off. Mm -hmm. This man kept revisiting me uh, throughout my life until I was about 17 or 18. But uh, the only time I got touched was on that ship. Um, I have an uncle, Uncle Willie, well, Guillermo. Oh. Uh -huh. He's from uh, Jalisco, a little town called Tuscueca. I mean, it's a little hole in the wall town. I haven't been there since uh, probably in the eighties. And um, he told me tons of just ghost stories of like hellhounds terrorizing people outside the church and uh, pigs with human faces and a lady in white. Every, every town in Mexico has a lady in white story. Crazy. Right. And just uh, faceless girls. And he just told me all these creepy stories. And the one story he, that sticks out my mind the most, um, he comes home late night and, and the town didn't have electricity in certain parts, you know, old school, old world Mexico. So a lot, a lot of, um, uh, oil burning lanterns or candles. Yes. So, and to this day, he owns his house, the house that he lived in with his grand, um, his grandmother and his mother and father. So he comes home from late night, hanging out with his friends. He's probably drinking. So he sneaks in the house. And I think he told me it was the oil burning lantern, kerosene lantern. He, mm -hmm. he, 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 you know, turn up the flame. So there's shadows being projected on the walls. And he's getting ready for bed. And in the back wall, he sees his own shadow being projected. And he sees a hand projecting over his head, reaching for, uh, 
reaching for him, like his shadow. Yeah. And he says it was elongated hand, long fingernails, just, and he got this vibe and he sees it and he sees his hand that's reaching for him, but like his shadow. And, um, he takes off running and he runs, I, I believe into his grandmother's room and he jumps under the bed and wow. he, he tells her, he tells her what she sees. So what convinced him, it wasn't him just imagining or he was too drunk, or whatever his mother and his grandmother come into the bedroom. They see the hand and prior to his grandmother coming in. Uh, she grabbed holy water and she casted holy water on the shadow and, the, and it, it, it reacted to it like it it kind of clinched right. and it disappeared into the wall and they, you know, there's been they, you know, stories that they talk about the la mano peluda or the mano yeah. pachona and they, he's like that's what it was i'm like come on tío. but he told me that story right right so flash forward um he got him when he moved to this country he got involved in restaurants and eventually became a he owned his own he went from working to owning to operating so he opened a uh, a restaurant in, in Buena Park, right by Nosberry Farm. And this was more of a sit down place with a bank room and a little cantina, you know, like a bank room and hall and so forth. And I experienced things there as well. And so this is probably, probably mid to late nineties. And uh, one thing I remember, you know, I have an older cousin who managed the place. He never liked going into the back office by himself when they were closing. And their staff told us they heard noises, the radio would change on its own, that uh, the kitchen staff did not like being there late, their, the, the carts would slam, they'd hear noises all the time. So my cousin's like, hey, go with me to the back office. And I'm like, why? And this is back in the day, people still use cash. Yeah. He's like, I gotta make a cash deposit in the safe and then um, we're gonna take off. And I've been hearing the stories. This is the first, the first encounter that I had. And um, I'm not gonna name the restaurant. It's no longer there, but the building's still there. Okay. So, um, he goes into the office and he tells me, and the only light that's on, it's in the office and in the front, the front part of like the restaurant by the hostess, the uh, hostess station, excuse me. So my cousin tell, tells me, Hey, start walking. I'll just walk with you. Yeah. No, no, I just start going. So we're walking to the kitchen. He turns off the office lights and I look back and the lights flicker twice. Okay. Faulty yeah. electrical. Yeah. And I'm like, Hey, he's like, Hey, just keep, keep going. Like he's, he's like, this is like a, a routine for him. Yeah. So we're walking through the kitchen. We walk past the grill and I'm hearing like noises coming from the kitchen. Like if pots of pans are falling or someone's hitting them together. I'm like, yeah. okay, maybe someone stacked them. They didn't fall. They didn't, they fell off the shelf. They didn't wear the counter. They didn't, they weren't stacked. Right. And I'm telling him, Hey, did you hear that? And he's like, Hey, just keep going. He wants me to disregard what I hear. So as we're walking out, the only light that's really on is the light by the hostess station and the entryway to the restaurant. And remember back in the day, they had the manual credit card machines mm -hmm. before they had everyone Slide them, yeah. and it had a duplicate paper. So we're walking past the hostess station and that thing's manual. It's not electronic. Not only I got a glimpse of it from my peripheral, I heard sh 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 the manual credit card machine go off twice. I'm like, he's like, yeah, just keep, just keep going. Just keep going. And my girlfriend's waiting for me at the time. And my cousin's like, hey, um, let me use the bathroom before we leave. So he goes in the restroom. So does my girlfriend. And then they're like, there's there's chairs there for like people waiting to be seated for the restaurants that sit down. So above you, it's kind of like a, uh, it's the second floor to the bank room. And there's just kind of like a landing up there. People could sit there and they could look down onto the main floor. So I'm sitting there and I'm trying not to look, but I'm, I'm looking up like this up at uh, the second level and I, pictured someone just like this is looking down at me watching me wow and it just put me on edge just put me on edge and i'm looking at the chandelier and again maybe it's my imagination the chandelier starts just drifting a little bit it's a big fancy chandelier and i'm, I'm a young man i'm like 21 22 you know just overconfident so we're walking out and he locks the door and before he locks the door i'm like ah we're leaving not gonna do nothing i'm out of here and the, the entire restaurant, it's majority of the restaurant, it's all glass windows. So, you know, you can see the view of the restaurant, the banquet yeah. room and all that. So we're leaving. So obviously what I said irritated what was, what was in this restaurant. So we're walking to the car. It's me and my girlfriend at the time and, and my cousin. She goes, oh my God, I look. Again, shadow figures. Yeah. And uh, my whole family, I've shared the story with them. A few of my witnesses, and they, they've experienced the witnesses themselves. I saw three figures. One seemed like, and it wasn't like it was a person just completely black. It was just an off black that stuck out in, in the dark of the room. Hmm. And up against the glass, it looks like someone has their hands pressed against the glass. They're looking out. 
The other one seemed like it was kind of floating in midair. The creepiest one was the third one. It, it's walking by. It stops. It looks out. And it bends over to look at us and continues on. So as we go to our cars, the figure, the one figure that was floating in midair, it follows us as we're driving past the building to leave the property. It follows the car as we're going from corner to corner inside the building and we take off. That was one experience. Wow. Um, another time I was there, um, I think we're in the kitchen room, in the, in the back of one of the kitchens. Um, it's a prep room and you see everything like bowls, like for Sunday brush, like menudo bowls and cutlery and so forth and, and cups and glasses. We're sitting there, we're talking. Out of nowhere, she grabs my hand and is squeezing the life out of my hand. I'm like, what's wrong? And she's not looking up. She's like, she has her eyes closed. She doesn't want to look up. I look up and the heat lamps are swinging offset. I'm thinking, okay, it's a building. Someone's on the roof. Right. A truck's driving by. I didn't think nothing of it. And then I'm looking and there's the trays that has all the cutlery for like the prep cooks and so forth or like the service to bring out for uh, Sunday brunch. They start rattling. They start, I physically saw them shaking. They're like just rattling and then the bowls from the noodle over dessert they start rattling too and i'm like let's get the hell out of here yeah so we took off another time we're sitting there just talking we hear the um, the office door slam bam physically physically heard someone stomping their feet through the kitchen angrily like they're mad about something and then you hear like you know the dumb waiter the uh, the waiter doors there's one way in one way out whenever the servers come out so they don't right. cross paths you hear those swing on hinges Someone goes into the actual grill and there's pots of pans sound like they're not falling on the floor, like they're being banged together. Mm -hmm. So she gets up and runs and leaves me there by myself. And I'm like, let's get out of here. It got to a point that once I think you accepted whatever was there, they no longer like, I give you, I guess, gave you a hard time. They're like, hey, now that you're aware of our presence, yeah. to, to be respectful. Now, now, and all this is related to this restaurant again, right? Yeah. Okay. The same uncle that came from this small town in Mexico. You know, well, now, now let me ask you this, because people are probably watching this or listening to this and are thinking maybe stuff like that happened in mine, in my home, my apartment, mm. or whatever the case may be. I mean, all we can do is speculate. Yeah. Do, do, do we believe, do you believe that maybe the person brings those things with him? Do you believe some, maybe something happened there and they, those spirits have been there for a long time? Or do you think maybe the the vibe that that restaurant, I, I guess, the people that come in there draws the attention of these ghost entities, shadow people, whatever. I mean, all we can do is speculate. Speculate. You know, I mean. What I believe is, um, like I believe like antiques. Antiques can have possession. I'm glad you brought that up. Antiques, uh, old properties, even people that have bad energy or give off bad, you know, I believe in the door perception. And it's some people's door perception is very narrow. Some people's very wide. And that's, that's another, that's another, another road talk about possession and the mind. But right. um, I think things get attached to people. You know, since I've been a kid, um, I must've been about eight years old because we left the city of Compton when I was nine years old. Okay. So I must've been about seven, eight years old, whatever, how old I was in first grade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Since that I can remember, I've always seen things. Mm -hmm. I've always seen things. I know I have brothers and sisters that uh, we see things too. Why we see things, I don't know. I didn't ask for it. People have always said, oh, it's a gift. There's times where I've shook in people's hands and I've seen things, possibly what, they've, what they're going through, mm -hmm. possibly uh, uh, some, like a shadow behind them, whatever the case may be. Uh, to give people an example of what I mean. One time I was with a good friend of mine and he said, oh, here comes my boss. And we were in Costco. And I said, oh, he go, who? So I'm looking for a dude. He goes, no, no, that lady right there. I shook her hand. And here's what I got, as, as weird as this may sound. She's angry, she wants revenge, and she's been through multiple divorces. Mm -hmm. Why that I got that, I have no idea. I didn't say nothing yet. So we leave. And uh, he said, uh, I was surprised she acted nice. And I said, why? Why? He goes, she is the biggest B, bro. <laughs> he says, everybody hates her. Mm -hmm. Everybody hates her. 
And then he started spilling the beans. He goes, yeah, she's been like dumped, divorced like two or three times. You know, she t always talks about, watch, you guys are going to get yours. All you males, like she has something against males. Wow. For oh, And then everything that I got from her handshake. Just from that. Just from that. Why I received that, I don't know. Do I get that all the time? No. But there are times that I do get those things. You said you've seen three figures, but one of them was like looking out of the window or something like that. I've seen that multiple times. Mm -hmm. I'll share that with you now. I have a brother that lives in Corona. Mm -hmm. Big house, a place they call New Corona off the 15 freeway. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, a abandoned house, like a brand new house. People live there. Uh, um, he said they used to live like rock stars. The house is pimped out. Okay. He wanted to show me inside the house. He goes, nobody's there. And I was like, nah, you know, let's just wait till somebody has the keys. No, I know how to get in. I know those people. And I was like, let's just wait. I didn't want to go in. Mm -hmm. So he's telling me, you could be my neighbor. You could move here. You know, you can, uh, uh, we could be like family again because he lives somewhat far from here, from us. And I said, I, I, don't, I don't know, man. I like the city. I'm a city boy. Over here, it looks dead. But me and you will be hanging out. We'll watch football. He wasn't going to talk me into it. So he's eating lunch. I walk outside, make a phone call. I turn around and look at the house. Two story, nice big two story house. I promise you, when I looked up, it looked like somebody walked and then went like this and looked at me. This is during the day. Excuse my language. This is during the day. Once again, it looked like this. Yeah. Like, no, thank you. And it, it startled me. I ran back in his house and I said, hey, man. And I said, who who used to live there? He saw me startled and here's what he said. Why, what did you see? So he experienced it too? Yes. And he, he I go, yeah, I, I, I saw, I, so I, I shared with him what I saw. I go home. He calls me. He tries to laugh it off. He calls me. He goes, yeah, you didn't see anything. You didn't see anything. And I said, you're not going to convince me. To move in. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to convince me. So then all of a sudden, I, I lost contact with him. Like he dropped the phone and he said, let me call you right back. That's what he said. About 15 minutes later, he calls me back mm -hmm. and he said, okay, I believe you. And I said, about what? And he said, when I was talking to you and you were telling me and I was telling you that's not real, something passed right in front of me and I dropped my phone. No, thank now you. it was in his house. Okay. So... <laughs> So now that's why I ask about do certain people, you know, uh, I like what you said, antiques, because I have a story about that. Mm -hmm. Is it people that that uh, draw these things more than others? Is it things that people buy that it comes with it? Is it a house? And I, like, again, all we can do is speculate. Um, a family friend of mine, I want to say 1996, hits me up call me they 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 um swamp meats and yard sales and antique stores uh they passed by a house that was i guess selling everything they saw some uh, congas mm -hmm. and the guy's you know he's a latino and he said yeah i'll, I'll take this how much he goes, well you're trying to get rid of five bucks cool i'll take it whatever he said every night for about three nights straight every night when Turn off TV, turn off the air conditioner, whatever, go to sleep, he'll hear a scratch. Mm -hmm. Every night. So he's thinking raccoon is under the house, there's rats, there's a cat, something is stuck in the house. He said, because I would walk around and I would literally all the time. And he was like, I, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. The next night. I don't get it. It just kept happening. It got to the point where I was losing three days of sleep. He said, so I kind of did the math on when that all started. And it was when he I bought, bought the congas. Okay. And he said, and I knew they were old. He was, I didn't even know how to play them, but I figured they looked nice in my mm -hmm. living room. He said, and finally, on the third night, or he said around 3.30 in the morning, he says, I started hearing. He goes, so I told my wife, I'm going to get up. I think I know what it is. And as I'm getting closer and closer to the congas, he's, he started hearing it. So he's thinking he must have placed it under a rat or, and was trying to get out for uh -huh. the longest time. Mm -hmm. So he turns it upside down. 
It stops. There's nothing. He's looking. Turn on the light. Nothing. nothing. Looks like nothing. Here's what happened. Puts it down. He just said that was it. Would it happen the same time of night? The, the, the same night. At, at, when he looked at it and he just put it down, thinking, okay, this is not it. Okay. But as soon as he put it down, he was, it was coming from that. I took it outside. I couldn't sleep the whole damn night. Mm -hmm. I went back to the house. It was a family there. And I asked him, who did you get this from? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, when we moved in, he said, there was a family over the year and they gave us all of these stuff. He said, so we don't know where it came from. No, thank you. He goes, we're just trying to get rid of it. That's why we sold you five bucks. You, you know. Do you think that family had that same experience? That's why they just wanted to get rid of yes, it? Yes, of course. So they knew what they were selling. Yeah, they knew what they were selling. But now here's my thing. How can you sell something like that to someone? I don't know. Without going into detail, kind of the same scenario. A person I haven't talked to in years. I don't know if they're still around. They, now come on, say they, they bought a, you know, they bought a throwaway gun, you know, oh, unmarked wow. gun. And um, it might have had a, who knows what I might have had it on that gun. But as soon as he got into possession of this gun, uh, just a lot of things started happening to him. Uh, nightmares, maybe it's his conscious, uh, was constantly just having bad luck. Uh, to a point he started having visions of just like, just, um, it's really demonic, in, uh, just imagery in his dreams and just visions of people dying. And just, it got to a point, I'm like, why do you even have that? Right. And who knows, might have been attached to that. Yeah. And it got to a point he got rid of it. But I believe things could be having some type of possession or just um, lingering energy from like previous owners, uh, properties as well. Or yeah. some people are just receptive to bad energy and they bring it with them where they go. Yes, I believe that's true. Uh, my father used to always tell me, referring to what you just said, bad energy, wherever they go, be careful who you allow through those front doors. Into your home. Yeah. Be careful. You know, sometimes in the past, I would go over like the homie's house. They'd have 15 guys laying around in the living room, drinking, partying, watching games. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with having a good time, but many times we don't know. Every single person. You know, every single person. You may invite me to your house and I may bring a guy that you know nothing about. Yeah. He may bring something and it'll stay in your house. Mm -hmm. We don't know. And that's why I, I tell my kids, be careful who you allow in your house. Mm -hmm. you, you never know. And many times, once again, things that what you said, antiques or whatnot, things that you get from people, you never know what, what they were used in or who had it before, what they did with them. Like what you said about the throwaway gun or whatnot. Yeah. You know, uh, those things could either, if we, once again, if we want to call them ghosts, uh, bad energy, entities, uh, shadow. If, if it isn't good, man, I don't want it. You can, know. I, can I share one more story? Yes, sir. Something that actually followed me home. So I went to um, a haunted attraction that was off, off season. And I won't say the name of the, of the company. But um, they did a, but it's very immersive, inter interactive. They did a mock seance. Wow. And it was, it, was, it, was, it was very detailed, a big production. And they had a table that looked, it, it resembled a Ouija board with a plancha and those 13 seats. Yes. So we knew that it was a mock seance, but there was some um, realism to it. Yeah. And at the time, the girl I was dating, she was very intuitive, I guess. I don't want to use the word bruja, but she was very intuitive and just, she knew how to practice certain things and she yeah. was very sensitive to energy. So we're sitting there and we're doing this fake seance and so forth. And I look at her and she's just she squeezing my hand. She's like, there's some real indications. This is, there's some real inklings to this. There's some real uh, uh, stuff that's going on here. I forget the, the, the verbiage she used. Prima said, yeah, this is like like a real seance. So they do the song and dance. They do performance, whatever. We go home. So we, you know, that night we're in bed together. And um, I, we're both laying on our side, our sides. So she's laying next to me in the way my bedroom was set up at the time. That the, closet, the closets were down a hallway to the, to the restroom. So she nudges me. But she's not looking. And I wake up, I'm like, what? And without looking, she just points over my body like this to the hallway where the, where, where the closet doors are at. Wow. And I'm like, what? But she's not looking, she's pointing. Like, look. Like she didn't want to look or she just knew something was there. And so coincidentally, the closet doors are open. So when I look, out of my, first I saw my peripheral and I just did a full on head turn, I looked over. It looked like 
you ever been on the haunted mansion ride at Disney? Yes. You know the it's like the statuettes of like like of like that like a head with like the shoulders like like a, like a bus. Bus. There we go. It's it looks like that, and it's just in the middle of the closet, and it's a pale green. And it's looking forward, not at me. It's looking forward, and I see it blink twice, and it looked like an older man. Wow. And so I, I completely froze, and I just said, I rolled over and said, "Hey, you don't you don't belong here. I live here. It's time for you to leave." And I look again, it's still there. And I can see it breathing kind of, and it blinks twice again. I'll say, um, it's time for you to go. This is my home, you don't belong here. And so I'm kind of paying attention to it through my peripheral and it goes from being, you know, exp exposed slightly in the closet to like, it just disappears in the dark and it fades away. Wow. I don't know what she did that night. Then the next day she did some type of protection spell, whatever, just did, did a blessing and I never seen it since. But that just goes to show me it's like who knows what we were doing that night maybe there's some there was something that we shouldn't have been involved in how much of that mock mock seance was actually real yeah um and just uh the fact maybe something attached to us because yeah. of our energy or because of her practices or things i've experienced you know previously so who knows yeah right? we don't know but obviously something was there yeah so we're gonna go ahead and uh take a five minute intermission break and uh, when we come back, I know we're going to change the subject up a little bit, but I want to share the story that a, a friend told me about two weeks ago okay. uh, when he found out that I was having this uh, podcast and he shared it with me. We stopped on the phone for about 45 minutes and uh, he brings something home. He, he at first he thought he had a haunted house, but he brought something home and you'll see that in about seven or eight days, pretty much his life had changed. So uh, before so before we switch it up, I want to come back and share this story with, okay. with everyone. So once again, every, everyone, uh, thank you for uh, tuning in. Once again, we're going to take a five-minute intermission break. Uh, take a water break. Uh, make sure you call somebody and let them know that Freaky Tales is live right now. We're halfway through what we call halftime intermission. Uh, once again, subscribe to uh, Freaky Tales podcast at, g um, at gmail.com. If you want to uh, share your story, I said that backwards, but also uh, follow us at Freaky Tales Podcast on Instagram. On Instagram, Freaky Tales Podcast on Instagram. And once again, Freaky Tales Podcast at Gmail if you want to share your story. If you want to say your name, that's fine. Uh, I know one of the stories we're going to be sharing when, when we return, this person wants to be uh, rena uh, named anonymous. So uh, we'll respect that. So once again, Five minutes intermission. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, everybody, to Freaky Tales Podcast. And uh, once again, I'm here with uh, my good friend, Rick Creeper. Make sure you guys follow him on Instagram. And he also has a podcast uh, that he also does pertaining to, uh, 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 you know, if you could share with them a little bit about your podcast, that you, what you do. So the name of the podcast is The Creepcast. I've had uh, scare actors that work in the haunted industry, independent filmmakers like Michael Santana, um, musicians, artists. Uh, who else have I had on there? A couple other people, voice actors, people like mainly me media people that work in the movie or film industry. But it's I'm trying to have like a, a theme of horror, horror like Halloween genre. But like you know, I, I like to have everybody on there. I haven't had them. I don't have any episodes like you do, but uh, you know it's up and coming. So yeah, okay. So uh, once again, follow him on Instagram, and fo also follow him on his podcast, uh, which I find, if I believe it's in his bio. 
Um, other than that, we will get to th at least three letters tonight and share with you guys uh, what people have emailed us. If you guys want to email your story, once again, freakytoastpodcast at gmail.com. Um, send us or email us your story there. Try to keep it within less or about two paragraphs, uh, not too long. And also follow us on Freaky Tales Podcast on Instagram for future content. So now, without further ado, please allow me to share something that someone that I've been knowing for about 15 years. This guy, I don't know him as a liar. Okay. I don't see if he did try to lie, why he would. Mm. But he calls me about almost two weeks ago and he shared something with me that it was probably around 12 midnight when he calls me he texts me first and he says hey carnal can you talk and i said yeah i can talk right now give me about 15 minutes i was watching something on tv so he calls me and when he's talking to me you know it almost sounds like he's like yeah i'm i, I don't want nobody to hear okay. that that type of sound he's being low-key he was being real low-key this guy i won't say his name but i'll just i always use johnny i'll just say his name is mm -hmm. johnny okay he owns a body shop he fixes cars and here's how it all started for him he tells me that somebody brought in a somebody bashed brought in a car where somebody bashed into them mm -hmm. okay uh, the trunk was still somewhat openable so he goes I, I i can fix this so he opened up the trunk and he says that he sees several statues there i won't mention the statue okay the type of statue that he he said he saw but he said he saw several of the same one some different colors okay uh and he wasn't your traditional if you will uh religious uh catholic statue okay so the guy walks up behind him and he says grab one and he just says uh why what is it he says, just grab one he said i'll give it to you you know and and, and he goes uh well i'm not going to give you a discount that's what he said i'm still going to fix your car but I'm not giving you no just grab one so he said he grabs one and he said it's about this big he said okay he goes he goes it's about maybe about arm's length that's what he told me so i'm assuming around this big and um he starts telling me that the guy starts giving him the history of the statue mm -hmm. he said all you got to do is give it water fruit every so often pray i know what you're talking about and that'll answer your prayers okay the reason I won't answer because eventually we're going to have a, a full episode on this okay. statue. Okay. So he said, um, okay, I'm not, I'm not a religious person mm -hmm. anyways. He said, my, I know my parents, he said, they, they go to Christian church or whatnot. I don't. He said, I don't believe in God. So he told me. He said, so why not? So we take it home. He said, in my hallway, there's a closet. We usually put like a uh, junk in there or whatever, like a little tiny sto storage room. And it's right next to my daughter's room, mm -hmm. who's like four, I think four. I think he said it was, she was four, three or four. So he said, and my room is next door to my daughter's room. So he goes, I didn't tell my wife. And the way he's telling me this, it sounded terrified. He goes, I didn't tell my wife. So I went ahead and put the statue in there. Uh, I didn't put like no food, no nothing. And I just said, um, bless me bless my family you know uh i want to be rich i want to make money but bless my business that's mm -hmm. what he said so i closed the door he goes and i hung up shirts in front of it so in case he said my girl goes in there mm -hmm. she won't see it he said the very first night i took my daughter in he said now my daughter is one of those girls that that can i get water like any other kid i leave my door open so that i can hear her when if she gets up so i'm looking at her she gets up out of her room and I hear her running back and forth in the hallway. And I finally tell her, go to bed. She doesn't answer me. Usually she'll say, I want some water or uh, I, I'm going to go to the restroom or something. And he says, he goes, and she wouldn't go to bed. She wouldn't listen, man. He goes, so I just told her, go to bed. And I'll just give his daughter named Norma. Norma, go to bed. Mm -hmm. He goes, so I finally got up. He goes, I got in my underwear. And she stops, she looks at me, he goes, now it's dark. And I know it's her. I hear her little tiny feet. I know how she walks. So I get up, she hears me, she runs for me towards the front door. So now I start running towards the front door for her. He said, we have a wooden door. He said, then we have an iron door. He goes, you know, you've been here. He said, I followed her and I go, get over here. She wasn't there, but the wooden door was wide open. Hmm. 
He said, and the iron door was locked. She can, she does not know how to open that one. Hmm. He says, so I turn on my, my the, the light to right there where you open up my door. I turn on the, the um, um, what do you call it, um, living room light. Mm -hmm. Turn on my kitchen light. He goes, and the first thing I said, let me go check on my daughter. He goes, so I go to my daughter's room, carnal. He goes, and she was, she was in bed. He goes, but she wasn't covered. He goes, it was almost like somebody grabbed her blankets and took them off for her. Because hmm. she was like, he goes, he was cold. You know, she was all cuddled up. So I covered her. He said, that was the first night. It freaked me the hell out. He said, it really, really freaked me out. He said, the second night, I'm shaving. Getting ready for tomorrow. I don't want to go to, he goes, I don't want to go to church. Oh, barbon, you know, yeah. five o'clock shadow. He goes, so um, everybody's asleep. He says, my daughter, my girl's asleep. I hear boom, boom at the door. He goes, my bathroom door. He goes, he goes, bro, he goes, that scared the hell out of me. And I said, okay, so what happened? And he goes, I heard it again, boom, boom. So I'm thinking, it's me, I'm in the restroom, go to the other restroom. So I open the door, there's nobody there. Hmm. He says, well, just to double check. I go in my daughter's room, she's knocked out. He said, my lady's snoring. Nobody else in the house. He said, but this next one, he goes, drop me to my knees. And I said, okay. He goes, so I just closed the door. And he goes, this time, he was being a little scared. I locked it. Locked it. All of a sudden, boom, boom. Aggressive. Yes. He said, I fell down. I fell back. He goes, I'm not going to lie to you, carnal. He goes, I was there for about 30 minutes. I couldn't get up. He said, I just kept staring at the door. He goes, I couldn't get up. And I said, is there anything like, was there somebody trying to open the door? He goes, no, I didn't see the like, door handle or anything move. But I couldn't get up. Mm -hmm. He said, after possibly like 30 minutes, he said, I grabbed my phone, hoping that my girl, I'm calling her, hoping she would wake up and come. Come, come to me. Yeah. Yeah. He goes, but she didn't. So I finally got up. I looked everywhere, nothing. He goes, so what I did, I got my nine, put it under my pillow and I knocked out. So that was the second day. The third day, my dad calls me. And he tells me, hey, you know what? They're fuming in my apartment. Can I stay a couple of days? I said, no problem. He goes, he stayed three days. He said, my dad's old, diabetic. He goes to the restroom a lot. Mm -hmm. So he came. He says, and I give him the guest room. Me and my dad stay up. He goes, I'm drinking. Says, my girl's mad because I haven't gone to bed yet. Every story that this guy's sharing with me gets freakier and freakier. And keep in mind, it's at 12 o'clock midnight. And he's sharing all these things with me. And in his tone of voice that he's using, is freaking me out. So here's what he says. Me and my dad are watching movies. He was able to watch like Netflix and stuff like that. He says, and it's like around maybe 12. And he decides to go to bed. He goes, mm. yeah, like mm. So I walk into his room. Can you need anything? No, I'll be good. Okay. I'll be in the living room watching a little bit more TV. He goes, my girl's sleep. Checked on my daughter about to sleep. I'm watching TV, he goes, it's probably about 1.30. I start dozing off a little bit now, goes, about an hour and a half. I hear footsteps in the living room, I mean, uh, the hallway, he goes, I got a long hallway. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, he goes, you know the hallway right there? I go, yeah, I've, I've been to your house plenty of times. He goes, I hear footsteps, but these are my dad's footsteps. He says, Abba, like saying dad, you know, Abba, he goes, nobody answers. He goes, so I, I hear him opening the door like he's trying to find a towel, so I'm thinking, Maybe he's trying to find a towel, maybe he wants to take a shower, maybe he wants to wash his hands. I don't know. Right. He says, so I finally get up. He goes, it's like, what? he goes, I look at the clock. He said, like 145. He said, I get up. I see my dad in the hallway. Goes, now keep in mind, the only, the only light that I have on is my TV. So I see my dad. He says, so I said, Abba, Abba. And I walk towards him. He goes, and as I walked closer, it wasn't him. This, this, whatever this thing was, he goes, turned around, walked towards me and butt me. He goes, that's the first time I ever felt something touch me. He goes, out of fear, I fell on the ground. He goes, now he see it no more. He goes, as soon as I fell on the ground, I looked at it, there was nothing there. Hmm. He said, I got so scared. He goes, I got up and I woke up my girl and I told her, there's something in the house. He said, but I never told her. He never told her about the, what, what, whatever he had. Mm -hmm. He goes, I'm going to go check on my dad. So they get up together. The dad's asleep. The daughter's asleep. Okay. Doesn't tell his girl anything yet. And I tell him, dude, it gets worse. And he said, yeah. <laughs> okay. He said for possibly two days, nothing happened. That's what he said. Nothing happened. So I'm thinking, it's cool. I see the guy at my job 
hey man, how's it going with my car or whatever? And he goes, hey man, I gotta tell you something. He said, whatever you gave me, he goes, and the first thing he said was, why, what did you see? He said, well, what did you give me? He said, did you give it? Did you offer it something? And he says, well, no. What am I supposed to do? He goes, I told you, you're supposed to offer it. So now he's laying down water and juices, fruit, whatever. You know, he doesn't know. He still has it in his house? He still had it in his house. Okay, he thought he did something wrong. And, and you know what I told him? I said, you know what it was? When that guy told you that it'll bring you finances, or it'll bless your job, that's why you wanted to keep it at the expense of your family. And he said, yeah, you're right. You're right. So here was this last night. This was on a Monday. He's watching TV again. His dad's already left. Mm -hmm. Okay, his dad only stayed there a couple of days. Daughter's asleep. Um, he's drinking. He's watching TV. He goes from 9 o'clock at night to about 4 o'clock in the morning. I found out I wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I fell asleep watching TV. He said, I had been drinking a little bit. He says, and, um, I know my girl's going to get pissed. He said, because now I'm going to bed and I got to get up in two and a half hours to go to work. Okay. He says, so I turn off the light, uh, turn off the TV. I go to bed. Okay. He said, I get in my bed and my girl tells me, okay, okay, that's it. That's it. That's what he says. Okay. So he's, he's thinking that this is the weirdest part. I've never heard a story like this. Okay. No. So he tells me like this, he said, I'm thinking I'm waking her up because I'm moving to bed. Okay. Two, two and a half hours later, I get up, I'm getting dressed. She comes up from behind me, she kisses me, and she tells me you were an animal last night. Shut No, no. <laughs> okay. So he, he's trying to remember, he goes, because I drank a lot. He said, I had like five or six shots of whiskey. You're trying to process what yes, happened. Yes, what happened. He yeah. goes, I had like four or five beers and I knocked out. He says, so I'm thinking to myself, oh shoot, did I come to bed and do something? He goes, so all day at work, I'm thinking to myself, like, why would she say that? So he said, we, we come home. He goes, I remember, he goes, he goes, and you know, now she's making spaghetti. I started helping her, you know, and uh, she just tells me, I want some more tonight. And he says, yeah, okay. He goes, hey, so, so, you, so you remember? He goes, and I'm, he goes, now I'm trying to play it off. And I'm like, so you remember? And he goes, yeah. He goes, so you remember everything I did to you? And he said, yeah. She, well, she said, yeah. He goes, like what? And he goes, well, I was laying on my stomach and you started going down on me from behind. Then you turned me around and you started going down on me. He goes, and you don't remember? And he said, well, yeah, finish telling me. And she said, no. We, we didn't had it like for two hours. We hadn't done that in such a long time. Okay. So at that point, he tells her like this, I have to tell you something. And she says, what? He goes, she, she knew I was serious. I took her outside because I didn't want my daughter to hear. And I told her what I brought in the house. And he, here's what he said. Is there anything that you can tell me or to convince me that that was me? Because I knocked out on the couch. That's what he said. Wow. And then she said, yeah. They went into the room. She pulled up her skirt. She had bruises between her legs. That's... Okay. I'm, I'm hoping he got rid of, you know what? At that moment, he got rid of it. And I said, uh, what happened to that dude? He goes, I didn't want to see that dude. I had my boy give him back his car. He goes, I fixed it. He goes, but I broke, got rid of that thing. So now, I know this isn't the subject and eventually we'll get into mm -hmm. incubus and succubus or whatnot. But I have heard of these stories where women wake up with bruises between their legs. I, I've, I've, there's actually a movie, I don't remember the name of the movie, that uh, a woman was being, um, she had a sexual relationship with, the, with the, the spirit in her house. It's a movie from the 80s. I, I wish I remember the name. Really? Yeah. And um, there was a book I read too. God, I'm drawing a blank. There's a book I read when I was in elementary school. Shouldn't be reading it, but uh, a family being terrorized by whatever entity was in a home and actually uh, sexually assault, assaulted the husband. Wow. So, um, that's just that's freaky uh this happened he just told me this about a week and a half ago so uh, this, this this was recent recent this was recent and he just told me he told me carnal if you're going to share it he said do not mention my name okay. he goes and it's too long for me to share he said but i just think that people should know in case there's people out there that have experienced the same thing you know but he goes but this one happened to my wife carnal he says and i know i know i didn't touch her 
Me personally, I'm not going to say the name of the statue. As soon as I would lay the items on it, now nah, I'm, 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 I'm good. You I'm don't getting stuff like that in your home. I, I know the history. Some people, I'm not going to go into detail. Okay. Some people pay homage to it, but I, I can't. Now, uh, I know before the break, we talked about that we were going to be uh, switching up the subject and there were some things you wanted to share. So if you can uh, open that up and um, share with us. Yeah. I know you had a couple of stories as well. Yeah. Uh, you want to get into history, legend, like lore? Absolutely. So um, I grew up in San Gabriel Valley, La Puente, Hassan Heights area. Yes. And um, there was an area that we knew that always had ghost stories and legends and lore. It was called, uh, it's called uh, Turnbull Canyon. Mm. So uh, Turnbull Canyon, on the north side of Turnbull Canyon, it's Whit North Whittier. On the south side, it's uh, the Point of Hills. Point of Hills uh, area, point, close to the Point of Hills Mall, where they actually filmed parts of uh, the movie Back to the Future. Oh wow! So I grew up, I grew up right, right, right around there, and we knew as kids like there was always like these freaky stories of, of uh, cultural, you know, cult rituals going on there, murders, bodies being found. It just you never went up there. Gang initiations. There's always these urban legends. Yeah. And so as a kid, we rode our bikes up there, and we, you know, you really didn't. I, you're a kid you don't really know but you're kind of freaked out because you're riding up there so on um, times that i you know later on in life as an adult i started doing research and um the area was going back to the early I don't know, probably like when the land when this area was occupied by spain okay when it was i don't even think it was considered mexico yet it was still part of spain but spain was spain and russia occupied territory it was indigenous tribes that lived in the area of the canyon and I don't know the, uh, the name of the tribe and their language uh, when they translated that canyon was called the dark place or a reference to the hell's gate. Mm. So apparently it was um, an area where they performed a lot of rituals or and so forth. In time, eventually, um, I think it was the conquistadors. It might've been another era. Eventually the Spaniards um, either put the indigenous people into missions and forced to Christianity or they're um, they killed eventually. So a lot, a lot of manslaughter happened. Wow. So obviously there's been a history of murder and just tyranny that happened on happened in the area. Flash forward, 1930, um, there was an insane asylum that was actually in the area mm. that catered to, you know, back then Los Angeles stretched all the way to San Bernardino County. Yeah. And they consider the empire like the country. So that's insane asylum would cater to people like in Whittier and Downey and so forth, Pasadena. Um, apparently it was a tragic, uh, uh, there was a fire that burned the place down to the ground. So everyone, a lot of people died and so forth. So there was always kind of like a, a lore that people wanted to go there and, and find this a lunatic asylum. And there was one story I heard of and I actually read about it where some of the, um, they didn't tear down the structure entirely. It was still up intact some parts. You could actually see where they did like the lobotomies and so forth and other procedures they did to, to make people sane. Yeah. And some kids were up there messing around and they actually got into one of the, uh, the shock therapy rooms. And one of them was messing around with some of the gear. Actually, it was a headpiece they put on, and um, they actually electrified, uh, electrified themselves and died in front of their friends. Wow. So flash forward uh, to 1935, 1940, there used to be a few orphanages in Whittier. And a lot of the kids started disappearing, little by little. And a lot of the remains of these kids, they had to find in this canyon for some reason. I don't know if this is true, but this is what I read and I was told. Excuse me. They associate a lot of the kids disappearing from Whittier in the orphanages. You know, random kids on the street or from orphanages, they were associated to uh, cult rituals happening into the area. And there's been stories of people seeing shadow figures, not necessarily like kukuis like this, but more like a shadow figure in a robe. But they would find these remains in certain positions, like if they were um, a part of a ritual. Oh, wow. not, not just left there for dead, I, sadly. But, um, it's, and it's, a, it's, it's sad regardless what happened to them. But they'd find them in certain positions. Yeah. Or they'd find them, you know lined up you know just they would find them lined up like in a certain in a certain pattern multiple um, multiple bodies but if for some reason it was always children at a, of a certain age so throughout the years things just happened in this area from the indigenous people being slaughtered and, and put in cat um put in captivity to uh this insane sound that burned down to multiple murders and it was it became an area for like a, like a kind of a dumping ground for like for bodies or for murders yeah that's yeah, what it sounds like so in 1952 there was a flight out of New York City, I guess, coming to Long Beach. Probably, long, probably a, either Long, I don't know how old Long Beach is, coming to the West Coast. Yeah. And the plane actually went down into the canyon. Uh -huh. And again, I don't know why, but uh, the flight had, majority majority of the passengers on the flight were children. Out of 29 passengers that died, majority of them were kids. 
So this just kept happening throughout the years. And I got to a point where the area developed a uh, um, kind of reputation like an urban legend to be in a dark place. And they, they, they got labeled the Hell's Gate. Uh, flash forward, I think 2020, I'm not going to say her name. 2009, a woman um, was found going door to door in the local neighborhood, knocking on people's doors. And she was probably in her undergarments and her th throat was slashed. She was dragged up there by friends, supposed friends, and um, they attempted to murder her. And somehow she got away and went door to door knocking on people's doors and for asking for help. And throughout the years, up until recently, you found bodies up there, uh, unsolved mysteries, not too far from there. And it's a little off subject. There's a park. I forget the name of the park. Um, I don't know if you ever heard. So the one of the original members from Los Lobos. Uh -huh. I don't know if you ever heard the story. No. I believe it was the original vocalist. He was incarcerated for, for murder. Wow. He uh, murdered his girlfriend. I believe the name of the park is Otterbein Park. It might be a different name now. It's across okay. the street from the Pointe Hills Mall, which is close to this area, uh, the Pointe Hills Reserve. He actually murdered his girlfriend, left her for dead in this park, but he was caught for the murder. So from that park, Otterbein Park, to the National Reserve, the Pointe Hills, uh, Pointe Hills Reserve in Turnbull Canyon, there's just been all these incidents of people to be murdered or just urban legends. That The whole cult thing, I'm not too sure. It seems more of like just like, like ghost stories yeah but uh, there has been cases of multiple murders and just bodies found in this area and people go hiking there it's a four mile hike and what's funny the girlfriend's like yeah you know she's, she's an avid hiker the girlfriend and she's all oh, we're gonna go hike into this new spot in whittier i'm like where and i'm thinking there's no hiking in whittier you know uh, she's like there's some hills some canyons i'm all uh turnbull canyon she's like yeah i'm like okay i'll tell you some stories when you get back <laughs> and um going back to when i was a kid we heard we heard ghost stories and just things that happened there but not just like you know the ghost stories but people being murdered and left for dead out there bodies being dumped going, yeah. going back to the 50s yeah. you know it's if somebody invited me somewhere and said you know the devil's gate or whatever yeah. you know you can miss me with that one you know what I'm, saying? <laughs> I'm cool i don't want nothing to do with the devil you know but um if i'm correct i think my niece if i'm correct told me about it and told me you should go check it out i'm gonna be real with you and maybe i'm like some people out there some people may say you're a scary cat i don't go messing around with stuff like that you I, know yeah i have and i haven't yeah you know there's some people that have said over there se me pareció el diablo the devil appeared to me there mm -hmm. or i seen something there i'm not the type of guy that's gonna say i'm gonna go see if he appears to me because believe me the stories that i have heard from people that say that they've seen things are not pretty stories and and many of them now many of them don't come back the same you know uh mentally yeah my aunt shared this story with me and uh i've never forgot this happened in uh juarez okay she said that her son i guess liked being around her whenever she would talk what well, the stuff itself we're talking about paranormal se me pareció el diablo the devil appeared mm -hmm. to me i saw this ghost i saw la llorona mm -hmm. you know because for some reason uh, not just mexican families but families all over the world have had these experiences where something appeared to them mm -hmm. so we know they're just not old folk stories we know that there's something going on in the supernatural realm and in the paranormal realm that we just cannot explain mm -hmm. but we talk about it because it intrigues us mm -hmm. she said that one time that um she tucked her son, you know, in bed and told her, I uh, told him, if you don't stop, se te va a el diablo. Yep. How many times have you been told that? Yeah. yeah. You know, well, she walks in the room because he's making a unrecognizable noise. Usually a mom or, or no, something like that. Mm -hmm. But she hears an unrecognized. She's telling me all this in Spanish. She actually, she's telling my mother before many, many years ago. And I was probably in my early 20s. She walks in the room and she sees her son. Her son, who was probably maybe, I don't know, four or five. Mm -hmm. Four or five. Jumping up and down. And his head is hitting the ceiling. He's jumping up and down. Mm -hmm. Not on a bed. But from the ground he's standing on the on the, on the ground and okay. he's jumping up and down he said his eyes are wide open and he's making a noise like if he's suffering you know he's not yelling hmm. uh the way she said like huh 
ah, something like that. And he was jumping up and down and his head was hitting the ceiling. And she grabbed him when they finally calmed him down after a few hours that he said, se me pareció el diablo. That's what he said. I've never heard of anybody, especially a kid, jumping up and down with his head hitting the ceiling, back and forth. I mean, how would you react to something like that? You I don't know. know. I, I wouldn't know what to say. Yeah. But, you know, many times our families will tell us those things, you know, stay in bed or stay up by the diablo or whatever. <laughs> and, we, and we stay terrified. Yeah. Sometimes I even wonder if we saw things that maybe weren't really there, but because of what our parents told us, you know, we did. But yeah, so that was one of the stories. Now, um, here's a freaky story. Probably a little bit off subject, but it's the same house that they were in. My grandmother, when she passed away, I don't know if you've ever heard of stories like this, especially uh, out in, it was in Juarez. When she passed away, her house fell off, fell over. Hmm. Like the house the demolished? Yes. <laughs> what? Her house just fell flat. Okay. A lot of people, uh, because she lived in a rancho. Okay. The only people that ever saw it were the people that lived there. So those are the eyewitnesses. Huh. So that's what was told to us, and it was giving us a picture. Mm -hmm. When she was in the hospital and she died, they said that the house flattened. What the f Now, I didn't see it, but I'm going off of relatives and people that we know that actually saw it. And it's not, every single one of them has the same story. Throughout the years, the stories never changed. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's one thing, you know, usually when somebody tells a lie and uh, they, they tell the story later on, it's a different, they add a little twist to mm -hmm. it. The next time it's a little twist. This story has been consistent ever since. What that was, we don't know. But these are things that intrigue us, and that's mm -hmm. why we share them and we share them with the people. Um, but other than that, was there anything else that you wanted to share before we get to these stories? Yeah. So uh, a quick story about my grandfather. So um, my Thank grandmother, my, my, my grandparents have passed. It's been, uh, my grandmother's buried here in uh, Forest Lawn, Cyprus, and my, my grandfather is in uh, Zacatecas. Okay. And so a uh, small little town called Jerez. It's a small town, but everyone you run into, they're from there. And um, they lived they lived on a property that was like 10 minutes outside of town. And my, my grandfather was here for years. He was a union carpenter, retired, went back to Mexico. So he had that, he worked with his hands. Yeah. So the house he had was about two acres of land. He was always working, he had a little tool shop. And he was always whistling when he worked. And he was always like humming, making noises and stuff. He passed away. And so relatives live on the property still. You know, and, um, it's called El Espacio. And so I think one of my, one of my tios that lives in Mexico, he still takes care of it. And they would have uh, family get-togethers. And this happened a couple of years ago, two stories. So they had a family get-together because it's, it's a big property. And so um, at the end of the day, they're cleaning up. And they're picking up all the trash, whatever, throwing things away. So one of them's like, someone was looking for a trash can or something. And when they're looking for this trash can or trash bags, they hear my grandfather. So, hey, there's some trash. They hear my grandfather's voice. There's some trash, there's some trash cans in the back of the house. Use, the ones, use those ones. And he comes back white as a ghost. And he says in Spanish, and he's all, I heard the voice of Don Miguel. And so keep in mind, he's got his workshop. Yeah. He's got his workshop attached to the house. So um, the workshop's like, it's, it'd be like kind of like a, um, like a back house that had like an apartment home above it. Yeah. So he's got his workshop and he'd go in there and do carpentry or whatever. And there's, they, they told me many times that they, um, they'd walk past his, it's a storage unit, his workshop, and they would hear him whistling. Wow. They would hear him whistling. Someone claims they saw him work in the work in the land because he had he had like horses and sheep or whatever, and he had like an acre acre and a half of land. And they saw him in the distance working on the fence line, and so he's still out there. And I believe it. I believe it because he was always an active person in the mall. If anything, that'd probably be his final resting place. Wow. And they told me the story. Is in, in a way like I'm, it's comforting, but at the same time it's a little a little creepy. Mm -hmm. Like if I saw my grandfather, I'd be like, holy shit. But um. They told me those stories and I'm not surprised. You know, it's just like, you know, um, my sisters have told me this. I haven't seen anything like this. Um, that my, well, first of all, my mother passed away first. And then several years later, my father passed away about 10 years apart. When my mother passed away, I don't know if you've ever heard stories where people say my mom passed away, but I thought I saw her. Mm -hmm. Like some people would say, I saw her at a bus stop. I saw her walking out of a market, almost like it was identical. Mm -hmm. I've never seen that, but all my sisters have told me, I saw my mother today. And after a while, I used to tell them, be careful. Be very careful because we don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, is it possible? I guess anything is possible. Is it a possible that it's a deceiving spirit wants you to welcome it home? Mm -hmm. 
we you know we don't know we sure. can only speculate recently uh my father was a guy that he had blue eyes real light skinned guy blue hat blue shirt blue dickies tennis shoes that's just what he wore it was his attire uh my sisters uh went on a road trip i got four sisters they went on a road trip they kept sending me pictures look our dad is with us and there was a guy i'll show you the picture after there was a guy sitting there look identically to my dad and i i swear to you they could have sent that to me and said look at this was the picture that we took of my dad a week before he passed like years ago yeah and i would have believed it yeah i would have believed it when i saw it i was like where did you get this he goes we're eating lunch and he's here and i love my sisters but stuff like that freaks me out i'm thinking look i'm the kind of person that believes that like they passed they moved on mm -hmm. i don't think that they'll come back physically in a form to like say hi or something but that's just me and i'm sure there are people that are watching or that are listening mm -hmm. that probably have seen their loved ones once again after they had already passed and i don't know if that's a something of a comfort for them or because it's not something that i would accept as something comforting i want to believe that they passed on their memory now mm -hmm. you know because uh, i deal with the fact that many times in the morning i get up and to be quite honest, I say to myself, I'm going to go get some breakfast. I'm going to call my dad to see if he wants to go. And I realized he's not here. He's not here. Yeah. You know, and, and that happens to me a lot. So, but um, anyways, brother, if, if there's any other thing that you want to share, you can before I get to this or we can start right here. Mm, jump on it. Yeah. Okay. This one right here, it is by um, what? Joe Ramirez reappearance of a longtime friend that's what he named it and it says here's one of several stories nice and compact he said my grandfather used to used to leave the house in mexico every summer to come to california and work in the fields at the end of the two months he returned he returned him to mexico and i drove with him to check uh, on his property he waved at his neighbor and best friend don juanito who was sitting on his uh, front porch at about noontime. He, he shouted a brief hello and decided to go to pick up a six pack of beer to catch up on things and have a chat. When we returned with the beer, we found two young ladies looking, don't, uh, locking, he felt looking, but locking Don Juanito's gate with a padlock. So we asked where the owner of the house went and with a serious face, they told us uh, their grandfather, the man who lived there, died two weeks prior. I was 14 years old and terrified, and I never forgot that moment. So this is Joe Ramirez, reappearance of a longtime friend. So apparently their father would come to work the fields over here, return back after two months. Mm. They saw a guy named um, Don Juanito, which happened to be his father's best friend. They waved hello, whatnot. So they left to go get a six pack. They come back. Two women are there, and they said, he died. I've heard of stories like that once again, like we just finished talking mm -hmm. about that we see loved ones and uh, we find out possibly either they died or they had already died, but we see them again, like what I just shared. Anything you want to share right here? I had a neighbor, you know, um, unfortunately, I saw, um, he passed away in front of me. I won't go into details. In coincidence, we were, we were associated through his brother and I, I used to work with his brother. And so uh, once we all connected the dots, me and the neighbor, um, let's say his name is Mark, we became really good friends. I woke up to a skirmish, something happened, and um, he was shot dead. He was shot dead in the alley in the complex behind me. I leave. I moved out because I felt uncomfortable. I saw him multiple times because uh, when I would drive home from work, I would take the same route. Right. And he would take the bus. He didn't drive. He was a big dude big dude um he stuck out tatted up whatever and so i would see him at the bus stop i'll stop in my work truck pick him up take him home hey why wait for the bus i'll take you home i drove past that bus stop in my personal car saw him sitting on the bench twice wow i go to the gym that we used to go to and i see him occasionally i literally it, i could have sworn it was him he he had a hoodie on and he's coming down with his gym bag and big structure big statue he looked like him he smiles at me and he's like hey how you been didn't say how you doing, it says how you been. 
And I'm thinking, did that guy just ask me how I've been? And it looked like Mark. I'll just say his name is Mark. And I looked back and the guy was gone. And so I called the brother who I'm friends with. And he's like, he answers the phones like this. What's wrong? I said, I don't know how to tell you this, but I've seen Mark three times already. And then the, the brother, who was my friend, says, he's came to me twice in a dream. I've seen him once on the street. So it was just weird to just uh, keep seeing uh, images of him. And maybe it was figuring my imagination, but I saw him twice at the same bus stop. I would drive past and pick him up. And I saw him once at the gym. And if it was, let's say someone that resembled him. He said, hey, how you doing? You know, just being nice right, to someone. Right. He said, how have, you, how have you been? Ask me generally, how have I been? Why would a stranger not ask me, how have I been? Like, it, if you say, how have I been? That means you obviously know me from somewhere. Yeah. But it just the resemblance was, was, it looked like him. Yeah. See, those are things that are unexplainable. Yeah. You know, um, I have a friend from Hollywood, lives in Hollywood, is in the music business, mm -hmm. calls me up one day, I want to say it was, um, I don't know, 98, if I'm correct. Uh, we know each other for a long time, uh, bought a nice house up there. Okay. Said he's talking to his neighbor. Uh, he goes, I've been away on the road for about a month and a half. I come back and I talk to him. Hey, what's up? He's working on an old school Volkswagen, that's what he said. He's fixing the engine talk to him i go how long did you talk to him for now keep in mind i'm asking this after he told me the story he was only for like five minutes and we were just talking he was smiling and i was like he goes like here's what happened he says so i leave for about a week i come back <laughs> i knock on the door hey you know what and i'll just say the name jeff you know i don't want to say the guy's name and that his daughter came out he goes now i didn't know that he had a daughter and now i'm here cleaning out his place and he said oh but where, where did he go he goes, oh, um, my father passed away a month ago. And he said, no, I was just talking to him. Like last week, I, I, I told him I was going to go away for a week. He goes, what, what did he say to you? He goes, no, well, he was fixing his Volkswagen. He goes, that Volkswagen was sold a month ago. That's crazy. He, and he, he's telling me this tone. I saw him. He was fixing his Volkswagen. He goes, and no, it was him. He's talking to me. He's, he's always talking, telling me, hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. He goes, I didn't even know he had a daughter. His daughter's there cleaning up his place. And he goes, so I said, show me a picture of your dad. Make sure we have the same guy. So he showed him. He goes, that's the boss. So he goes, yes, yeah, light blue. He said, he was just out here. That's he crazy. said, okay, when my mom comes, I need you to tell her this story. She goes, why? He goes, because others have seen him too. We can't explain that. But I just needed to share that story because it went along with what this gentleman named, uh, once again, Joe Ramirez, reappearance of a longtime friend. Shares, thank you for that. Uh, here we have one called uh, 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 Just a Story, uh, Yvonne Maldonado. Okay. Um, hey, my name is uh, Yvonne Maldonado. I have followed everything about paranormal. It was always brought. It was always brought my attention. It's the way she wrote it. So please bear with me. My attention. A few years back, I had something happen to me where I was in ICU for about five days. At one point, I heard my abuelitos voice telling me it was not my turn to go to go not my turn to go go back to my kids ever since the day i've noticed that i've have the ability to to feel and see and hear things things that are not there i can also sense things that are not there it's hard but i'm learning to live with it it's scary because even if you don't want to and if you don't want to energy comes to you and you can't stop it i've always asked myself um what can be done to kind of stop that hope you have some kind of help for me thank you greetings from livingston california there was a couple of little typos right there so pretty much what she's saying is <clears throat> uh, i guess uh, i follow the paranormal for a few i guess it's always been brought to my attention a few years back she was an icu I guess she heard her abuelitos tell her it's not your turn to go back. Mm -hmm. But ever since then, I guess she's been sensitive to things. She could hear things, uh, see things, uh, uh, things that are not there. She says, that's kind of scary. What can I do to pretty much either stop it, slow it down or whatever? I'm going to give you a very wise answer. Honestly, I don't know. Uh, how do you stop that? How do I stop from shaking hands with someone and seeing things that I see? You, you can't because yeah. you don't know when it's going to happen. Some people are just, some people are very intuitive. I think we all are to, to, to a certain capacity. Yes. Some are a little more sharper than others. Just like when you shook, you shook that person's hand, you got certain feelings. Yes. Some, some people are able to con 
have communication with the dead. Some people are can pick up are energy sensitive. My beliefs, I think we all are to a certain level. It's just like some people are meant to be mechanically inclined. Some people are more inclined to be, you know, administrative position. When it comes to intuition, I think it's just um, it's a different it's a different different levels of perception. She just might be so fine tuned to it that uh, she can't turn it off. Yeah. And um, there's people that they're so and I have friends and so forth. Um, they're so sensitive to it that they sometimes they cannot be out in public or certain places without spirits approaching them yeah. and to start speaking. And they'll, and I'm having a conversation with this person. She'll hold on a second. And someone's talking to her and it's this spirit picked up on her, how sensitive she is, and, or she can't go past graveyards, churches, old neighborhoods. Um, and she's done tarot readings for me, this person I'm speaking to. Yeah. And um, when she's done for me, she'll stop and mid say, hold on a sec. And she'll give me more information because someone approached her. Um, I don't think it's something you can, this again, my belief and you know, everyone's each his own. I don't think it's something you can necessarily turn off. It's just how sensitive you are. Yeah. Some people would even go as far as saying that the, it's a gift yeah. that's been given to you. Many times, a lot of these gifts, we just don't ask for, you know, then we, there's the question, who gave it to me and why, you know, yeah. a lot of these questions, you know, we don't, we, against we don't again, know. We don't know. Um, this is from, it's called Freaky Tale. This person wants to be uh, anonymous, okay. okay? And it says, one evening when I was 17, my siblings and I uh, were watching TV. I got up to use the bathroom. As I opened the door to the bathroom, something in me felt weird. I don't remember shutting the door when I opened my eyes. Two unlit candles that my mom had over the toilet were spinning in place. I stopped them and went back out and asked if we had an earthquake. Everyone said no. I went back towards the restroom and before walking before walking in, I looked towards my parents' room. Something in me was telling me to go towards it. I did. As I walked into my parents' room, I see a dark shadow. The shadow shoots up towards uh, the ceiling as I'm hitting as I'm hitting light switch the light bulbs pop that was the first time i had ever witnessed anything paranormal and to this day it freaks me out tony last episode you briefly talked about the king james bible i have a sister that has been reading it and since she's uh, started she's been a totally different person very negative and distant you guys touch on it more thank you love the show okay so so anyway he was 17 years old he walked into the restroom. I guess on the restroom, uh, I guess on the toilet, they have uh, two, I guess, two unlit candles. And I guess they were spinning. Mm -hmm. So they came out, he went outside, I believe asked his family, do we have an earthquake? They said no. Before he walked in, back into the restroom, I guess he looks towards his parents' room, if I'm correct, saw a dark shadow, something <coughs> told him to go in there, mm -hmm. okay? Goes in there. Uh, this thing says uh, the shadow shoots up towards the ceiling. As I hit the light switch, the light bulbs pop. Now that is something freaky there, okay? He says, I, uh, the first time I had ever witnessed anything paranormal till this day, and it freaks me out. I don't know if he wanted us to elaborate or he was just sharing, but um, something spinning, obviously something moving now. Mm -hmm. Then he says that he felt something calling him. I felt that same calling when I've shared this before on previous shows where in the, with, uh, my old home, we had a garage that was not attached to our, our home. And I always felt something. It's like you don't hear a voice. That was a, that was a creepy story. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you don't, don't hear the voice, but you almost feel like a something. And you don't see that, but you, you, you feel it. Yeah, you feel it. And so I understand what this gentleman is saying right here that he called him, but it, here he saw the shadow, what we were talking about, whether it's a ghost, whether it's a shadow, we don't know. But obviously something was calling him. What that purpose was for, I don't know. The light bulbs going out, that's another freaky tale. You know, we don't know. Um, anything you care to uh, share before we get into this King James story right here? There, there's been association, like when people do like uh, paranormal investigations, like camera equipment dying, batteries dying, lights getting drained. There's association with, with paranormal, like energy to, to electronic equipment. I can't say this is the reason why the bulbs blew out, but right. um, you know, like whatever shows I've watched or people I've talked to that done their own, that their cameras go from ninety percent battery life to zero. Yeah. 
uh, lights completely dying. I mean, I could see maybe why that's like, I'm loosely just thinking that's maybe why the lights popped. Who knows? Uh, as far as a spirit, I mean, or a dark shadow, I mean, who knows what's in that house? Yeah. Who knows what that family's been going through? Yeah, it, it's very hard for us to speculate because we don't know the history of the home yep. or if somebody in there is secretly practicing something. Uh, give you an example. Had a friend, had a big family. His sister was practicing the occult in a closet. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. This guy decides one day to go to church. He uh, goes to a Christian church. This is the guy that told me the story. He said, and he said, I just felt free. That's what he said. When I got home, I felt something negative from my sister's room. She was taking a shower. I don't know what led me. He said, I think it was God. This is his story. Mm. And I opened it in there. She had candles. She had a voodoo doll. She had all kinds of stuff. Even stuff where she was cutting herself. <coughs> yeah, so here's the person that's sensitive to that. And he <coughs> was the guy that went to church. Mm -hmm. You know, so some people don't go to church and are still sensitive. So it's kind of hard to tell and to elaborate on something that we don't have a full uh, um if you will, the full story, other than just exactly yeah, what we have here. So now here it says, Tony, last episode, you briefly talked about the King James Bible. Um, I have a sister that has been reading it. And since she's started, she's uh, been a totally different person. Why? I mean, very negative and distant. Can you guys touch on it? Uh, first of all, let me say this. I studied ancient history and I've always studied the, um, <coughs> I studied the Bible. I have a little bit of water that I haven't touched, brother, if you want to, um, um, I've studied the Bible uh, and I read it like a history book. Okay, and um, I, I've heard stories where people—I don't know what kind of church or if she goes to church—but <clears throat> when you read the Bible, I don't think the Bible itself makes you act different. I don't think the book is the problem. I think sometimes the people are the problem. Mm -hmm. For an example, if um, if I go to you and I said, "Hey, you know what, um, sir? What does this mean?" and you give me your interpretation of it, mm -hmm. okay. Many times, I, I probably didn't even really get what this meant. I just read or understood what you told me. Mm -hmm. So now, if you tell me uh, you gave your life to God and all your families are sinners now. So guess what? Since I look up to you and you're my teacher, all my family and brothers are sinners now. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys need to get right. That's what sometimes I believe people interpret as negative, And it could be because you probably have the right intentions and to share with them. But you're going about it the wrong way. Wrong way. And I think a lot, that's a lot of people, they're so gung-ho that they don't realize that they're insulting people, you know, and people interpret that as negative. And you've already turned the people off so much that they're never going to listen to you. So I think so a lot of times when people get involved with whether it's the Bible, whether it's other faiths or whatever, it all depends on how you approach people. I think it's a delivery too, and you have to understand they might not have the same beliefs or, or feel the same way, you know, the same strength as far as the passion for me. You know, right. I might... I might be a watered down Catholic and you might be a born again. Right. You know, it's all the interpretation and just the way you deliver it, I believe. Yeah. Uh, um, it, it, let me share this one, this one story and hopefully this helps. This is a guy that he would read the King James 1611 Bible. And here's the funny part. He told me he was a Christian. So he said, and uh, one day we we're hanging out on a Saturday mm -hmm. and I said, just, just hang out. We're going to grab a couple of beers or whatever. And here's what he said. Nah, man, I got to be in church on time. He said, because I don't want to get whipped again. Really? That's exactly what he said. And, <clears throat> and I gave him that look. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, yeah. He says, uh, after, they give you, after so many strikes, you lay down on the bed, they tie you up, and they whip you. The, the pastor whips you. Can you say what church it was? Well, see, I, I, he said he was a Christian. That's what he said. Okay. But we know traditionally, you know, in churches today, they're not going to do that. Oh, yeah. Okay. So obviously, he belonged to something that was calling itself Christian. Hmm. So to try to answer and elaborate on this gentleman's question on that she's so different, we don't know where she's going or where she learned it from. True. So it's kind of hard. I don't think it's the scriptures. I think it's the person interpreting or sharing with her or telling her what this means. Um, had another buddy who went to a so-called Christian church. And believe me, this has nothing to do with, I believe, with the Bible. I believe it's the people interpreting it that they told him and his sister, your parents are sinners. You guys need to move out. And they did. Hmm. 
they moved out and they no longer had communication with the mother and father because they were sinners according to this man that called himself the pastor that extreme okay yeah I, I, whatever it is i call those a cults you know or cults cults yeah, yeah cults you know when uh, somebody starts starts to tell you how to live you know that's when it becomes dangerous wow so other than that brother we've run out of time i want to thank you for coming thanks thanks for having me on you know what i've had, a, had an amazing time thank you um the stories you share and um maybe in the future we'll come back because i know you got a lot more you well, i got a share. lot still i got yeah. a lot of stories <laughs> so uh once again his uh ig uh rick creeper rick creeper 11 11 it should be popping up on the screen uh follow him and uh on his bio he's got links to his podcast check out his podcast and uh once again above me is the freaky tales podcast gmail so if you got stories that you want to share and um we print them out once we get them and uh we share at least three we'll, we'll try to get to four eventually three to four stories per night and we'll try to elaborate try to give as best answers as we can uh below me should be the freaky tales podcast on instagram freaky tales podcast on instagram for uh follow us there for future content so once again subscribe to freaky tales podcast on youtube like comment dislike honestly it doesn't really matter i know some people hit dislike on purpose you know but people that's just, okay people are just sour yeah it's it's okay uh don't be surprised the next time you hit dislike that there's something standing behind you okay <laughs> i'm just letting you know <laughs> so other than that hey listen uh next friday we have another special guest so make sure you guys tune in freaky tales podcast coming at you live and direct thank you once again rick creeper thank you sir thank, thank you, you very much and uh once again i want to thank john elkins for making this possible and uh my words with you i leave expect the unexpected now as you turn off youtube look behind you good night <laughs>